And let's begin with the leaking Supreme Court uh, the, and what we learned uh, about the 2014 leak, which was also the leak of an Alito opinion. Uh, there seems to be uh, quite a resemblance to what we saw this year in the leak of the Alito opinion overturning Roe versus Wade. Yeah, a few things uh, converge here, Lawrence. The first is uh, organized plans and patterns to put people in touch with the justices, to lobby them offline, out of line, of, out of sight of other parties. Um, and you can only imagine the conversation that got a Supreme Court justice in a room with a wealthy individual in order to do that lobbying. Who made that connection? And of course, uh, it appears that many of whatever these events were at people's uh, clubs, at people's homes, uh, were not reported. And that is all consistent with a lot of the stuff that we've been tracking about this Supreme Court, um, failing to make uh, proper disclosures like everybody else when there are uh, recusal and other concerns, failing to investigate, to use the power of investigation uh, that, as you said, Chief Justice Roberts displayed in the Alito draft opinion leak, and this constant, constant engagement with uh, very, very rich right-wingers as they go about doing the business of the rich right wing. You know, we think of the Supreme Court as removed from it all, and then really physically removed from it all. It's not easy in Washington to think about, you know, if I wanted to run into a Supreme Court justice, where would I go? Uh, it, it just isn't that simple. Uh, enter the Supreme Court Historical Society. Uh, were you surprised that the Supreme Court Historical so Society is now on the map of the flow of dark money? No, it has been a gathering place for people to uh, hobnob with Supreme Court justices, and the price of admission for that is to make significant contributions to a fund that helps maintain the Supreme Court and various artifacts of the Supreme Court. So it's ripe for uh, misuse, and it appears that in this case it has been misused. Uh, we've actually been tracking this group, Faith in Action, since before this broke because of this earlier pattern of whining and dining of the justices and had written an earlier letter in September to Chief Justice Roberts asking for an explanation and some, some answers. And all we got back from him was, uh, we have an ethics code. And this seems to be a persistent pattern again with this court. They won't answer specific questions. They won't conduct inquiries into ethics matters. They don't do the work of finding out whether there's been an investigation. They just point at the ethics code as if that makes all of the activity go away. So can the Senate Judiciary Committee become the ethics investigator of the Supreme Court? And while you're at it, uh, can you say uh, the United States government will fund uh, the Supreme Court Historical Society? It's not allowed to take any more contributions. And if there's any important historical artifacts to be maintained at the Supreme Court, uh, in conjunction with those in the federal government who know how to do that, we at the federal government will take care of it. Well, I think a good hard look at the Supreme Court Historical Society is in order and uh, stand by for further information in that regard. Um, I think that the important thing is that the Supreme Court should have not just a code of ethics that is a wall hanging, but a code of ethics that works like a real code of ethics, so that if somebody has a complaint, somebody looks into the complaint. And if there's a question about what a justice knew and when he knew it, that bears on whether he should have recused himself, that a proper investigation is accomplished, that we're not having to listen to Justice Alito answer by unsworn press releases, but in fact, he goes through a regular, fair, honorable process of answering questions which, if they were false, would be false statements so that uh, the truth can be brought out and uh, the integrity of the proceedings of the court assured. 